Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, we have a very exciting guest speaker today. It's a happy Friday, at least outside here in North Carolina, but I'm excited uh, that we have so many people joining us from all over the US, I believe. We've got Pennsylvania, we definitely have Virginia, um, North Carolina definitely, but I don't know who else we have. And maybe you could just in the chat just say, I'm from India. <laughs> but this is, this is really exciting. So we have um, Bethany Eden joining us today. And it's Beth and Al, Rob. Oh, I know that. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, Miss Smith. <laughs> um, so Bethany and I, uh, we met in, in grad school. We're actually, we're in the same lab together, Debbie Steinberg's lab. And another Steinberg student that has gone on to conquer the world. Um, and not to embarrass you, Bethany, because you shouldn't be embarrassed by this, but I actually have a, a, a copy of, this is your first paper, right here. Yeah, okay. so you can explain this a little bit, but this is um, your master's work? My master's thesis, yep. Yes. And uh, this is this is great work. Actually, this is your thesis. Yes. This is actually not your paper. But no, uh, the paper was published in Deep Sea Research. Deep Sea Research. Um, but the, the thesis, yeah. This work here is um, fantastic. You're looking at zooplankton in different eddies in the Sargasso Sea. And if I remember correctly, you're working a lot with um, with Sarah. Sarah mm -hmm. Stone. Yeah. You were the postdoc in the lab at the time. What was your favorite thing about this this work? Um, I think that was the first time that I actually was able to really realize how collaborative and interdisciplinary marine science truly is. Um, that was my very first research cruise. So I arrived in Virginia in July and like a week later, I was on a boat in Bermuda, you know, in the middle of the Sargasso Sea for three weeks um, sampling. And so it was really a trial by fire learning, you know, how to sample zooplankton and how to live on a ship. And, and do all those things. Um, but really just the interdisciplinary nature of marine science is, is probably one of the biggest takeaways from experience and it's something I'm gonna talk about um, in today's talk too. Cool, so, um, so you've obviously been really interested in ocean exploration right from the word go, right? In fact, science is exploration. It's Absolutely science of discovery and that's how we gain our knowledge. In fact, that's the scientific method, right? So today um, you're going to be talking a bit about marine archaeology and I'm going to give a shout out here to the Ocean Exploration Trust. Um, they were the organization that supported um, your expedition. Is it yeah, yeah, they, yeah. And they're, they're joining us today from Washington State. So that's yeah, that's Yeah. So that's what, that's, oh, Bethany. Um, hey, Megan, that's that's um, Megan Cook, their outreach wow. and education specialist. Megan and I actually um, joined OET the same year. We were both science communication fellows um, the same year. Megan um, then went on to get a job with OET. So she's hanging out with us um, to probably provide answers to questions that I don't even know the answers to. So we'll, we'll, we'll go from there. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. All right. So I'm going to pass it over to, to you to, to share your screen. Sure. And while you do that, I'll just remind everyone, um, it counts up to 38 computers joining here. Um, if you have a question, please put it in the chat. I'll moderate it and um, make sure that your, your opinions and, and questions are heard. Um, I might ask the question on your behalf and just make sure that your microphones are, are muted throughout this. So, great. Well, thanks. I really appreciate you joining us today, Bethany. So, yeah. I'm excited yeah. to learn about this. Absolutely. So um, I want to jump off real quickly by saying I am not um, a marine archaeologist. In fact, my current role is as a teacher. Um, I teach marine science to 10th, 11th, and 12th grade students at Chess Governor School here in Virginia. Um, and like Dr. Rob said, I am trained as a zooplankton ecologist. Actually, my master's degree is in biological oceanography from the Virginia Institute of Marine Science. But in 2013, I had the really um, awesome opportunity to join um, the Corps of Exploration with Ocean Exploration Trust and um, explore shipwrecks. 
in the Gulf of Mexico. So we're going to talk a little bit about ocean exploration, what it is, why it's important. And then I'm going to share the real, real exciting stuff with you all about um, the Monterey shipwreck. So why do we explore the oceans? Well, we live on an ocean planet. Basically, about 71% of Earth's surface is covered by water, um, but only about 5% of the ocean has been explored and mapped. So there are vast reaches of um, planet beneath the waves that we don't know anything about. We don't know what it looks like. We don't know what's down there. We don't know what organisms live there. And um, so it's really, really important for us to learn about these blue spaces on our own planet. Um, beyond that, the ocean is really a source of sustenance. Lots of people eat seafood that comes from the ocean. We use the oceans for transport and commerce, moving goods between the continents. Um, and really a source of growth and inspiration. So many people love to just go to the beach and draw lots of inspiration and peace and relaxation from that environment. Um, and the oceans play a huge role in biogeochemical cycles um, around the planet. So they play a role in the air we breathe, our daily weather, our climate. They per can provide energy resources for us. So this blue planet that we live on, this ocean that's surrounding us is vitally important. And understanding it and understanding what's there is really, really important for our survival as a species. So what sort of things can we explore? Well, like I mentioned, um, ocean exploration and oceanography in general is really, really um, an interdisciplinary field. Pretty much any discipline has an ocean exploration. You can be a biologist and look at really cool creatures and um, on all of the different um, Nautilus exploration legs we've seen so many different creatures like this really, really cute Dumbo octopus. They are one of my favorite um, deep sea octopus species. Um, and there are a number of them that are called Dumbo octopus because um, they have those little fins coming out of their heads that look almost like giant Dumbo ears. They flap them, that's how they use them to swim. So we can also look at things like chemistry and physics and geology when we explore things like these hydrothermal vents and methane seeps and hydrocarbon seeps in the deep sea. Um, of course, we can look at archaeology and shipwrecks, and there are hundreds of them the world over that can help us understand more about the cultural resources um, and ancient history on our planet. We can study ecology. We can study engineering. Um, it's a huge feat of engineering to get subs and robots into the deep sea to help us explore. That's a really, really harsh environment, and so building and engineering and designing these robots to go to those places um, is really, really difficult and technical as well. We use math in all sorts of ways um, in ocean exploration and even people that aren't necessarily interested in careers in the true science, people interested in telecommunications and computer science, um, data processing, all have really valuable applications in ocean exploration and marine science. Um, and navigation and even shipboard operations. We need people to operate the ships, to be the mechanics on the ships, to drive the ships. And so there are so many careers that have really, really great applications um, in the ocean sciences. So if you're somebody that likes science or is interested in science, but really sees yourself in a career field um, that's not necessarily the true science, you will still find applications of that career field um, in ocean exploration and, and in marine science. That's really what makes it so unique is there's so many people with so many different backgrounds that all come together to help accomplish um, the mission. So how do we explore the ocean? And while there's a lot of different ways, and this is not um, certainly an exhaustive list, um, shallow ocean, I mean, you can just wade right in. You can take a net, you can take a fishing pole, you can take the scuba gear, your snorkeling gear, and just go look around. Um, but it's a little bit more difficult when you get down into the deep ocean beyond scuba diving depth. And so you need some specialized equipment. And so there are three basic ships that are designated basically as ships of exploration. Um, that is NOAA's Okeanos Explorer. That is our federal ship of um, exploration. The, the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration operates um, the Okeanos. The Ocean Exploration Trust, EV Nautilus. Um, Ocean Exploration Trust is headed by Dr. Robert Ballard, who you may recognize his name from his name. Um, it also has a lot of work on hydrothermal vents, um, among other things. He is a true ocean explorer at heart. Um, 
And so he has designed Ocean Exploration Trust to really have a true mission of exploration. Um, and the other exploration vessel is the Schmidt Ocean, Ocean Institute's RV uh, South Core. Um, the Schmidt Ocean Institute is headed by um, the Google people. Um, and so the RV South Core is their ship of exploration that's also out doing um, a lot of research as well. Um, those three ships are sort of pioneers in this idea of telepresence technology, which I will get to in just a second. Um, there are others, but those are the three big ones. So here's um, EV Nautilus, and we'll talk more about the ship and her specifications. But ships come in all shapes and sizes and are outfitted to do all sorts of different things, um, and Nautilus is certainly outfitted as an exploration vessel. Um, we can also use robots. This is my favorite robot. This is Hercules, and um, he is the remotely operated vehicle, one of the two remotely operated vehicles on board Nautilus, um, and we'll talk more about him specifically in a little bit, but so we can use robots to explore the ocean. Here is the other robot on board EV Nautilus. This is Argus. Looks very different from Hercules, um, but has really important job to do when we talk about um, ocean exploration. We can use these things called AUVs and gliders. AUVs are autonomous underwater vehicles, meaning they are not tethered or attached to the ship in any way. They are essentially robots that get programmed to fly a specific mission underwater, and they fly that mission, and they collect data, and then they surface and get retrieved and so forth from the ship. These come in all different shapes and sizes. Some of them look more torpedo-like shaped. This um, is the AUV Sentry, and this one looks more like a giant Cheez-It. Um, so again, able to collect data independently of a ship. It just needs the ship to transport it to where it's going and drop it in the water. Did you just call that a Cheez-It? <laughs> I did call it a Cheez-It. It looks <laughs> like a giant. It's true. Um, we have HOVs, or human-occupied vehicles. These are like little submarines or submersibles. This is um, Alvin, and this is one of the most famous deep-sea exploration subs. This is, again, not attached to a ship at all. It is piloted by someone sitting inside the sub, driving it around, collecting samples. Um, you can usually fit like two people, a pilot, and one other person, um, sometimes two inside these. Also very useful for ocean exploration. Beyond those sort of robot things, we get these things like ocean moorings, which are essentially independent data collectors that you drop over the side of the ship and leave it on the bottom of the ocean or leave it floating in the water column somewhere for a period of time, maybe buoyed, and then you go back and pick it up and you collect all your data off of this mooring and um, process your data that way. We have net. Um, sonar is also really, really important in helping us identify features on the seafloor. Um, and believe it or not, even satellites in space can give us a lot of really, really important information um, about the sea surface and about the ocean and about ocean chemistry, um, and even down to assemblages of teeny tiny zooplankton um, that we can sort of gauge and measure from space. So we can look at microscopic things from space, which is really cool. It is pretty amazing where it's come. Yeah. It's it's fascinating. I think Barbara has a question. Sure. I think Dylan may have as well. He had his hand raised, but Barbara, if you want to um, let me unmute your microphone here. Um, hang on. I need to find it in the chat because you said it somewhere. Um, I said, what does that mean? Like, no, no, never mind. Oh. Hang on, I'll find it in a second. Like, you said something. Um, okay. <laughs> what's a torpedo? That's my question. Good question. Yes, excellent question. question. So the torpedo-shaped gliders look more like long, skinny, almost like a hot dog, right? Long and skinny, and they have a small propeller on the back of them. Um, and they're just more streamlined. Like the the sentry is more of like a rectangular shape and sort of big and bulky. And some of the other gliders are more like airplane body sort of shape. 
Um, they don't have the wings like an airplane, but they're just that rounded, long, thin um, body shape. Yeah, think think of uh, if you've ever seen a tuna and then like a, a round tuna with like a, a propeller at the back. Yeah, that would be like a like a torpedo. It's like an airplane, no wings, and a propeller at the back. Yes, that's it. <laughs> Good question. Yeah. I should have put a picture in there. Was there another question? No, I think that was the only one. That was it? Okay, perfect. Oh, uh, there's one from Cameron as well. Cameron, do you have a question? He said yes. Okay, unmute your mic so you can ask your question. So my question is, like, how how do you find like stuff that's at like the very bottom of the ocean? Great question. Um, I'm gonna answer it in just a second. So hold on to it and see if I answer it in the next slide or two. And if not, then I will come back to you and answer it better. Okay. So. One of the big exciting things um, that Nautilus and Okeanos and the Falcor are all involved in, um, in terms of not just ocean exploration, but is sharing that exploration with the world through what we call telepresence technology or a live stream. So we have this Zoom conference right now where we are able to connect people from all across the country and even all across the world if somebody from the other side of the world wanted to tune in to. Um, and sort of similar to that, we have the ability on these ships to be able to live stream what is happening on the ship, wherever the ship is in the world, to the internet. So anybody can tune in to watch what's happening. So we have this ship to shore um, connection, which allows live video and audio from the ship. Wherever it is, um, in the world's ocean, we can be hundreds and hundreds of miles from land and still be broadcasting ocean exploration in real time. This allows us to be able to connect to scientists on shore, or experts who maybe couldn't come out on the ship, but who can lend their scientific expertise in real time as we're doing the ocean exploration. And it also allows viewers like you guys to connect and watch what's happening and see it happen as it's happening. So the robots on board, um, the ROVs have cameras and they're collecting video and that video is live streamed right from the ocean floor or wherever they're exploring um, straight up to you as you're tuning in to watch it. And so I've linked um, on this slide the links to the live streams. None of the ships are exploring currently but um, this will be there. Dr. Rob will post it to the YSA website, so you'll have it. Um, and you can access it when the ships are um, actually exploring live. Um, there's links, those links also take you to all of the content um, from past live explorations, lots of pictures, lots of videos. Um, I'm gonna show you some in a little bit so you'll see it. But that's the, the neat thing about um, these ships is that they allow anybody basically to come in and be that explorer along with you, um, along with the team that's on the ship. So here's the ex more of the exciting things, at least for me, is you know what what did I get to do? So um, I joined the Corps of Exploration in 2013 as a science communications fellow. Um, this um, is something that you can apply for. As an, as an adult, as a educator, you don't have to be a science educator, um, but they have a program where you can apply um, and be selected to join these expeditions as um, a science communicator. And I'll talk a little bit later about what that job actually entails. Um, Ocean Exploration Trust also has opportunities for college students to come along um, as navigation interns, as science interns, as ROV interns learning to drive the robots. So um, there are a lot of opportunities. They have a um, art contest for elementary age students. So um, you guys can check some of that out too to design the expedition patch for that year's expedition. So the exploration vessel Nautilus is really, really well outfitted 
for um, ocean exploration. She's 211 feet long and carries roughly about 48 people. That includes the scientists and the crew. So she has to have a permanent crew that keeps the ship board operations running. So, you know, a captain to drive the ship, first mate, second mates, engineers. There are cooks um, to keep everybody on the ship fed and we are fed very, very well on board Nautilus. Um, she operates with two ROVs, Hercules and Argus, and I'll get in more detail um, with them in a second. She is outfitted with a multi-beam echo sounder, which is one of the tools that we use to see down in the ocean without actually sending the robots down. So we will do um, sonar surveys, and there's lots of different organizations that use sonar surveys for different things of the ocean, but that's sort of the way that we, and this answers Cameron's question, to, to really sort of look at different parts of the seafloor without sending robots first. So it gives us ways to sort of very generally discern different features of the seafloor without actually sending a robot there, um, which is a little bit more costly and time consuming. So we can map big areas of the seafloor with things like the echo sounders and, and sonar and find features of interest. And then once we identify those features of interest, we can take the robots and drop them right down on the features of interest. So a lot of the exploration that we're doing, we're not necessarily doing blind. Um, we're doing it because it's been mapped at least with sonar first and we see on the sonar features that might look interesting. And then we can go to that GPS location and just drop the robot and have a look around and see what's there. Uh, that, um, the uh, other, there's a lot of technology on this, on this, uh, on this cruise here. So, uh, yeah. so how much did this cost? Five dollars, ten dollars. <laughs> I'm always, I'm always. This is like multi-million dollars. Yeah, multi-million. Um, and and it, it, the technology is still growing, and and so um, I mean the the thing that's so one of the things that's so cool to me is just the the thruster. So Nautilus, when we go out to operate. We're usually operating in thousands of feet of water. So there's no, you don't anchor, right? But like, how do you maintain your position in that spot in order to robots to operate effectively? And so she's outfitted with these um, bow and stern thrusters that allow the ship to maintain position within like one meter. So you have this 211 foot long ship that can maintain its position within like three feet using the thrusters um, in sea swell and then be able to move the ship in very, very small increments as the robots explore and continue to move around. So it's amazing the, how they do it. It, the it is amazing. Technology is just absolutely incredible. Um, I have a, a tour, a video, a short video tour of Nautilus, like a walkthrough so you guys can see awesome. what the ship looks like and all the different compartments. So um, let me pull that up for us. While, gonna... while you're pulling it up, uh, there is a, a movement on the chat here that there needs to be a class trip, a class expedition. <laughs> We're going to have to do some major fundraising for that. That's okay. I've got some ideas already. Okay. Let's see. So I'll ask Bethany a question. You must be very excited heading to this. Yes? Yeah. I mean, this is... This is so, this being selected for this mm -hmm. was um, absolutely incredible. Um, just being able to join in on this sort of an expedition. And um, let's see, can you guys see? We can't see the video. Okay, we let just me see, see here. The here we go. Of okay, there we go. Oh, yes, now we, oh, yes, here we go. Okay. Yeah, no, being selected for this is like, to me, was a once in a lifetime opportunity. It was absolutely incredible um, to be able to do this. So I'm going to play the ship tour. <laughs>
I've been on this since my time. Bill Moana is probably the best I've been on. <laughs> but this, this is not the typical Houston Express song. This is my, I think someone said, is that the Titanic? <laughs> yeah, um, Nautilus is pretty pretty cushy um, compared to some other research vessels I've been on. She is beautifully outfitted. Um, they didn't show any of the sleeping berths. I did sleep in a in a quad berth, so two sets of bunk beds shoved in a very very small area. Um, that part of it is, you know, on any ship is not so glamorous, but um, certainly the common spaces on board um, are very, very well outfitted um, and just beautiful. What was your favorite meal on the, on the ship? Um, I actually celebrated my birthday on the ship. Um, so I think my birthday meal, I got a birthday cake. Um, and the Nautilus chefs are all fantastic. Um, and so probably my birthday, my birthday cake. Was wow. <laughs> probably my favorite. I would think baking a cake at sea would be the most challenging thing. <laughs> they they have gotten quite good. Um, you know, when I talk to other people who have been out on different legs, um, you sort of see this evolution in the the cake making birthday treats happening, and I've I've seen some amazing, amazing things. Um, the, the ship, the Nautilus crew, is just absolutely fantastic. Can we see the, the presentation now? So we're good to carry on? Yep, we're good to go. Okay. All right, so here are um, Hercules and Argus. And again, I'm not gonna get bogged down too much on all of the different technology that they carry. Um, Hercules is the yellow robot. Hercules is um, the one that is outfitted really for ocean exploration. It's the one that's got the arms to be able to pick up things, all of the storage compartments to put different samples in. It's got all the sensors. It's got lights and camera and GPS. It's about the size of a Volkswagen bug vehicle. Um, weighs about 5,500 pounds out of the water. Um, it can be changed and altered and things added or taken off as needed depending on what the mission really is. Um, and it is tethered to the ship. You sort of see the yellow tether coming out the back. Um, that tether goes up to Argus, which is the other robot you see here, and then the line that comes straight out the top of Argus is what actually attaches both to the ship. So power is fed down to both through that, and then all the video feed um, and data collection sort of feeds are fed back up to the ship in that way. Um, so they work as a two robot system. They are both controlled from the ship. So nobody is on them. Um, they're they're both controlled by two different pilots um, on board the ship. And um, Hercules is rated to a depth of about four thousand meters, so we can explore. That's about thirteen thousand feet, a little over thirteen thousand feet. So we can explore that deep. Um, going any deeper can cause catastrophic failure of the robot system, and that is not something we would want. What What are the main um, challenges with with uh, sending something so deep? So there's a couple. Um, one of the big ones is operating in salt water, mm -hmm. which is um, very conductive and very corrosive on the equipment. So that's a, um, a big issue is just the salt water and how corrosive that is and how tough that is on the equipment. Um, the other is the pressure in the deep sea um, and that can cause all sorts of huge failures um, for robots in the sea as well. I mean, the pressure down there can, can shrink. Um, we, we send um, styrofoam cups down on Argus. Um, and if you think about the normal size styrofoam cup, my styrofoam cup came back from 13,000, or from when we were operating about 4,000 feet of water um, on this leg. My styrofoam cup came back the size of a thimble. So I went from a normal size styrofoam drinking cup to one about that big. So, um, I was just trying to lot. find my one here. I've got it here somewhere. But, um, mine is on my desk at work, which I cannot get to. <laughs> yeah. So, actually, there's a good follow up question from David. I don't know if he can um, unmute his microphone.
Well, I'll ask for you on, on his behalf, but how much pressure is actually down there? That's a great question. And there's a physics equation we can use um, to figure it out. Does anyone know this? We can, we can put the actual equation. If anyone knows it, put it in the chat. <laughs> yeah, I mean, essentially for every, it's one atmosphere for every 10 meters you go down in the ocean. So we were operating at about 1,300 meters um, in, on the Monterey Rec site. Um, so one atmosphere, you have one atmosphere at the surface, so you guys can work out the math. Um, it is thousands of atmospheres right. of pressure. Um, that's about, one atmosphere is about 14 and change pounds right. per square inch. Because, you know, pressure is just a force per unit area, right? So just imagine the, the mass, that just the sheer mass of the water, right, that's above you at that depth is just an, an intense pressure. Yeah. It's absolutely so incredible. The, to the design of these robots, they're trying to restrict the surface area too of this. Right. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And so the reason we operate with a two-body system is because... We have to be attached to the ship. And so I have a, a link here and it'll be there in the in the presentation when Dr. Rob posts it. I'm not gonna play the video now because I've got other more exciting videos that I want to show you guys. Basically, the whole point is that Argus acts as an eye in the sky. Argus has cameras and lights and can help keep track of Hercules, make sure Hercules, um, the pilot has spatial awareness and is able to see things maybe outside of his field of view by using the cameras on Argus. The other thing is that with being tethered to the ship, the oceans are not always flat, calm. And so the ship is moving and rocking around. And what happens then is the tether to Argus gets yanked. And so by having a relatively heavy body, almost like a sled, Argus gets yanked and tossed and pulled around somewhat. We don't operate in really heavy seas, but Argus gets pulled by the ship. But what that allows Hercules to do is operate underneath without being tugged on by the ship. So it allows Hercules to operate basically like a scuba diver would, completely weight neutrally buoyant in the water um, without being yanked on as the ship is moving. Right. This is sort of a, a real quick view to show you what that eye in the sky looks like. This is a, from Argus's cameras, looking down at Hercules as Hercules is exploring um, the wreck. Um, and you can see the outline of Hercules with his lights looking at the, the shipwreck. Um, and you see that yellow tether coming up and sort of floating up and that's actually attached to Argus. So how did we find out about the Monterey shipwreck? Well, it was sort of a serendipitous discovery. Um, the um, Bureau of Ocean Energy Management requires operate in the Gulf of Mexico to sonar survey the areas they're interested in working in to make sure that they're clear of any sort of cultural heritage before they operate in those areas. So in 2011, Shell was surveying an area that they were in one of their leases they were interested in operating in, and they came across these blips on their surveys that looked like ship hulls. So they turn that information over to Bureau of Ocean Energy Management. Um, solved found how to look around and said, hey, this is a really cool shipwreck. Somebody ought to come back and, and do a more detailed survey. Um, they saw lots of artifacts. They saw it was very well preserved. Um, like I said, it's in, it was in about 4,300 feet of water, so completely undisturbed, very deep, well-preserved, um, contained a lot of different artifacts, including things like artillery and firearms, navigation instruments, um, medicine, personal effects, lots of really, really cool stuff, which I'll show you here in a second. Um, the wreck was roughly 84 feet long and 26 feet wide, um, and this really the exploration of this shipwreck was a partnership between a number of different groups. Um, OET provided, you know, the vessel and some of the manpower, um, but but the real sort of scientific investigation came from another of a, a bunch of other different groups that all sort of collaborated to create the research design 
for the project. So I'm gonna um, fly y'all through the the rack, if you'd like. Oh, this is exciting, yes. We'll have so, a... This cruise was um, in 2013, July. In July, yeah, July 2013. So it's like a three year anniversary from Deepwater Horizon. Right? Correct. Um, any oil on the outside? Any evidence of? Um, we didn't see any. Um, there were other legs that same exploration season, 2013, that were looking at some effects of Deepwater Horizon on um, deepwater corals in the Gulf of Mexico. This wreck was um, sort of, it was 170 miles-ish south, southwest of, out of Galveston, Texas. So sort of on the opposite side of the Gulf of Mexico from where um, Deepwater Horizon was. Let's see, you guys see the video screen? Uh, we don't see the video, we just see the okay. um, see Let's the see. I keep having to switch <laughs> screens. Okay, let's see. Here we go. All right. Oh, yes, now we can. Okay, here we go. It's great. Let's just keep following this edge to the bow. What you see sticking up in the from the bottom are the spikes and the nails that would have attached uh, frames or ribs. You also would see where the planks would have been uh, in place and where the copper sheathing would have been nailed in. The marine organisms have eaten pretty much everything that they can digest. Jim, um, what's the size or estimated size of this ship? This vessel appears, the target's 84 feet long. It's about 26 feet wide. That doesn't necessarily reflect the original width or the beam of the ship because it's canted or leaning over onto its starboard side. And we've got a cluster of artifacts that seem to have settled into place as the ship was going down, perhaps. That includes a long gun. It includes a couple of other guns beneath it. There's an anchor in there and a number of other metal objects. There are, there's other, other neat stuff to look at. Okay, <laughs> let's go ahead and, and, and move inside the bow. Do you see where the, the, those bottles are? I say we let's grab some images of the bottles. Right. Uh, there should be some ceramics there as well. And then we'll move to the anchor. Uh, that's way cool. Yeah. So, um, and that was broadcast live for for everyone to see as we were seeing it um which is also really cool so everybody was allowed to you know come along with us i'll talk about some of the artifacts here in a second but i do want to show you um you can see where it says shipwreck 15577 that's the approximate location um we were very guarded about the location of the wreck it's in really deep water so you need um highly more highly specialized equipment to reach it however i mean because this could contain important cultural heritage. Um, we want to guard the exact location and, and keep it safe from, from looters and those sorts of things. So um, that's an approximate location um, of where that wreck was um, in the Gulf. That one that says Eco Gig, that was the, the cruise leg that was looking at um, deep water horizon um, impacts on, on deep So we, we still see the video. Um, you might want to oh, flash. Do you? Yeah. Hang on. Yeah, that's it. That's perfect. There we go. Okay. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. Yeah. So the echo echo gig is more or less where Deepwater Horizon. Correct. Was. Yes, and that and, yeah. that leg was looking at um, so the effects on on deep sea corals yeah. in that region. Yep. Right onwards. So. One of the really neat things um, that we're able to do with the technology that's on Hercules is create these photo mosaic maps of the wreck site. So essentially we take Hercules and fly it at a really low altitude over the wreck in um, a pattern that we call mowing the lawn. Essentially you're just going one way and turning and coming back. And, and so you do that zigzag or mowing the lawn pattern over the entire wreck site, taking thousands of pictures looking straight down at the wreck. And then through um, computer-aided technology, you can stitch together all of those pictures to create one large um, map, photo map in high resolution of the wreck site. And so this is the one um, created 
for Monterey A. Um, you can see in very clear detail anchors. Um, the big square in the middle is the ship stove. Um, the long thing sort of next to it is what they call the gun. That's one of the cannons that we saw on the ship. You can make out bottles and jars. Um, you can very clearly make out the edge, that copper seat sheathing um, around the edge of the shipwreck. And so uh, not just to be cool to look at, but this also provides us um, a way of cataloging artifacts that were retrieved off the wreck. So if we take one map before we retrieve any artifacts, and then do our artifact retrieval and then to another map, we can see how the site has changed or disturbed and we can see the exact location of where those artifacts were removed from, um, which is really good for documenting purposes. It also allows us to create these really cool 3D maps that are manipulated and manip manipulative um, of wreck sites. So if you've ever watched the TV show, Drain the Ocean, this is sort of the technology that they use to drain the ocean, to take the ocean away so you can see what um, this feature would look like without the water around it. And so all of those numbers, if you actually go, um, there's a, a virtual archaeology museum that you can access online. I'll send you the link for it. You can explore all sorts of shipwrecks um, through this 3D photogrammetry technology. Um, and on that site, you click on each of those different numbers and it'll give you some information about each of the different um, parts of the ship. But it, I mean, it's just really, really cool technology that allows us to explore these wrecks in ways we've never been able to before. I, I was gonna make the comment that the previous image I thought was the coolest thing I'd seen in a while. And then you flip to this one. That, that's, this, <laughs> this is cool. Yes. It's, it's so, so neat. Um, just just by taking all of those high res pictures from the row and the robot is what really allows us to do that. Um, it's a very, very slow mapping process, but the results it creates are just absolutely. So what sort of things did we find? Um, well, um, as you might imagine, artifacts are what help archeologists and scientists tell the story about this. We don't know, um, who was on this ship. We don't know where it was coming from or where it was going. Um, we can place it in the early 19th century given the artifacts that we find on it, given the type of ship that it is. Um, but beyond that, we don't really know much. There wasn't you know, a, a bell with a nameplate on it that said Titanic, right? There, there were not these things to be able to, to give us a cl clear knowledge about who these people were on this vessel. Um, and so by examining the artifacts, the hope is that we'll be able to narrow down sort of the possibilities of where the ship was coming from, what it was doing. Um, so we recovered roughly about 60 small and medium sized artifacts. We didn't bring up the scope. We didn't bring up any of the cannons. We didn't take a giant anchor off the seafloor. Those things wouldn't, while cool, wouldn't exactly help us be able to identify um, the origin of this vessel. So all of those artifacts were um, conserved um, and Texas State University and the Meadows Center for Water and the Environment were sort of heading up that portion of it. Um, the hope ultimately would be to have these artifacts displayed, you know, museum style so people could come and see them. Um, I do want to show you guys some real-time video of how we, you know, saw the artifacts on board so let me awesome. okay could you date the objects like could yeah you... so that that was part of it was being able to um being able to figure out um where the artifacts and date them right and and know you know where they came from or who was using them. All right, we got video. Wow. Can we pan around There's and get the so, and yeah. look back on those that musket pile? Yeah, I can do that. It's just going to take me a minute. Sure, sure. <laughs> Are but you believe it or not, what we see as archaeologists in the patterns of all of this is a stack of muskets. And a bottle. And a bottle. And a bottle. Go ahead. Okay. 
That's salsa kills or something? What is that? Where, what does that look like to you that's coming up? A cannon. Looks like a gun. Yeah. Oh, but we had this conversation. Once a cannon gets put on a boat, it's called a gun. Exactly. Yeah. See, I listen. Good one. Yes. There's a vial with so something can, in it. Uh, change the There's a jar with the yellowish now. stuff. To the that might be ginger. Yeah, muskets. I think for everybody yeah, watching us out there on the internet, mm -hmm. you see, <laughs> while this may look to you like watching paint dry, Everything we do and the more we can learn without disturbing, the better, because as I said earlier on this mission, okay. we're like doctors doing a very careful biopsy here. The plan is not to just lift everything up. The plan is to do a very slow, careful biopsy taking only what's necessary to make a diagnosis, because archaeologists like physicians have a, a mandate to do no harm whenever we can avoid taking things or harming things, we, we will opt for trying to document it in place. So the commentary you're hearing is what happens when we're on board the ship in the control room during dives. Everybody has a headset and we're all communicating and talking to one another and explaining what's happening. Um, the scientist who you heard commenting on a lot of that was Dr. Jim Delgado. Um, he's written a number of books on marine archaeology. Um, and so just explaining what we're seeing in real time as we're seeing it um, on, board, on board the vessel. So you might be starting to wonder how we um, retrieve those artifacts yes. and get them back to the ship because that's exciting and interesting too. Um, Hercules has a whole bunch of different tools and what's really neat is that the ROV engineers have that shop that works up so they can craft new tools as needed. Um, and that is exactly what happened on board Nautilus. Um, this is a suction sampler that we used. Um, the, the ROV has two arms, one that's called Predator and one that's called Mondo. Um, the Predator arm is the one that's much more dexterous. Um, it's able to do a lot more functions. It does the more delicate sort of pickup work, retrieval work. Um, and then Mondo is, like the name suggests, um, Mondo is sort of the, the strength arm. The, we don't want to say smash, because we don't really want to smash anything. But that's the arm you use if you need the, the strength, but not the dexterity. Um, so this is a suction sampler. And the ROV pilots have the ability to adjust the strength of the suction based on what they're picking up. So they, they picked up this bottle that was full of ginger, which would have been used for seasickness, preserved ginger, um, for seasickness for the sailors on board um, this wreck. We also, um, for this expedition, used what we call an artifact elevator. And this was built on board the ship out of necessity. And essentially, it is a framework for carrying some of the larger artifacts to the surface. So we put weight on it and sink it to the seafloor. Hercules loads up all of the larger artifacts and secures them. And then you pull a cord and drop the weight and the artifact elevator rises to the surface. It's got buoyancy on it, so it rises to the surface. And then we put a little boat in the water and go collect it and lift it back on the ship and can then take um, artifacts off of it. So you see Hercules here using that suction sampler again to load some artifacts, but there's some other larger things already on there. There's a box on the other side that we put some of the um, musket pieces in that we retrieved. Um, so things like that are really vital when Hercules doesn't have the space in its internal compartments to be able to retrieve some of the larger artifacts. Um, it can also use that arm to retrieve artifacts. This is um, a piece of a navigation equipment called an octent. Um, you may have heard of the sextant, um, which is the more frequently used or common piece of equipment for navigation. This is the octant. It's just the circle divided into eight instead of six um, is really how it works. And you can see the, the bio box on board really is pushed out so it can just drop that artifact in there. That one was small enough to fit. So you can, Hercules can pick things up very gently in the claw manipulator arm as well. Um, this is sort of a scooper that was designed on board the ship to pick up the musket. So we needed something that was going to be able to very delicately lift the long, fragile pieces of musket barrel. And so we used that sort of a scooper to do that. 
Um, but when in doubt, you just are resourceful. Um, we had a lot of de more delicate things um, and we needed some sort of scooper. And so the ROV engineers on board took the dust pan out of the ROV hanger and outfitted it um, with a, a thicker handle so Hercules could grab it. And we stuck, you know, a big paintbrush in Hercules' other hand and you use that to sort of sweep gentle, delicate artifacts into the dish pan, the dust pan, and deposit them safely into the bio box. So this is a sand clock. Um, it looks like an hourglass. It's what they would have used to do um, their transit measurements. So measuring things like latitude and longitude before you have GPS, you need an accurate way to tell time and on board ships, sand clocks were the way to do that. And so, um, you know, artifact retrieval doesn't have to be fancy and high tech. It can be as simple as a, a paintbrush and a dustpan from the ROV hanger. <laughs> so, this is way cool. Um, so the first thing is there, there's actually a machine shop on the on the boat on the ship. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's an ROV hanger, so they can do a, a lot of the repairs, a lot of the um, you know post. Um, expedition, wash down, clean up, repackaging, but yeah, they can they can retool a lot of things right there on board the ship that they need to. And duct tape? Yep. Oh, lots of duct tape. Lots of duct tape. <laughs> yes. All right, so let's see some of these artifact recovery tools in action. All right. Monterey wreck that on we were and on the first out here investigating that. on this leg. Oh, good, so these place. three vessels are all in a similar area of the Gulf of Mexico and they all lie in very similar depths of water. Yeah. Have time to investigate this third wreck before we started mapping. So hopefully once mapping is over we'll get back to yeah, poking a around our wreck um, and seeing what else it holds. So, so hang with us here on Nautilus Live. You are watching us models, explore this shipwreck. And it is one that no one else has ever seen before. So you're seeing it for the first time right alongside us. Just from a computer Just processing. Those of you on Nautilus Live so asking if either. Uh, most uh, present day ships you have ballast tanks and they use water uh, from the provided us the opportunity to, to, to draft a full and complete um, research really design that would help guide so our research that we would help guide which objects we would go after and, to recover you know, uh, in order to answer certain uh, very specific research wine. questions um, um, so we knew that the these other yeah. sites okay, existed, but we had no information on them. Eight meters. And so uh, this is more you of an exploration of these vessels. Of a giant anchor hanging out of the sand uh, there. We do not this have a there? permit to recover anything. Um, that's we've the not, soul of a we've shoe. not written a research design. So soul, and so as exciting as things meters. are, or as things may be on, on either of these two new uh, sites, uh, we have to be responsible um, about you know, what our life. obligations this are a under a pretty deep specific wreck. permit. We saw and, a couple fish and crabs hanging out, but the other you know, table these until, until other another other day when we can come back with mind is, uh, uh, copper a full research design copper was used and, to prevent uh, to, the deterioration uh, the, uh, the of wood. This is really an opportunity to see what's on these wrecks, get some basic information, and then go back and think about it, do some research. Um, and develop to those the research crush, and organisms that, that we're trying to eat away. How far is the gone? So that may have an effect. I think Nautilus on Live is suggesting a research that question. That <laughs> or maybe they've come yes. up with their own at least as is... a thought about that and are asking that same question. So let's see. So um Bethany um, sorry, I've been offline for the last 10 minutes. My internet crashed. <laughs> oh, no. Yes. So I missed a few of the, of the slides, but, um, I, I think we got, we got most of it. Yes. Okay. I'll send you the, I'll send you this, the PowerPoint. It has all right, the videos. Yeah. Content, so. so there's going to be about four or five slides, um, that, that are missing, but thanks for 
keeping uh, running the, the show here. <laughs> I didn't even know you were missing. I was just carrying on. <laughs> um, last but not least, you know, people wonder, how do I get involved? How do I get to, to do this? How do I, how can I watch? Um, so this is a screenshot from the Nautilus Live website. Um, if the ship was out actually exploring, the video feed from the ship would be playing live streaming on the website. But even when the ship is not out, there are tons and tons of really cool things to look at and see and view from past um, expeditions in the photos and videos tab. Um, EV Nautilus also has a YouTube channel, which is where I've sourced um, the videos that I shoot today from. So you can watch all sorts of exploration videos. They're not all going to be shipwrecks. There are some other shipwreck um, explorations there. Cool um, deep sea creatures. There's some video when not a, when the uh, ROV Hercules encountered a whale. It was pretty cool. Um, that one got lots of high viewership. Um, Any giant squids? Um, no, some some vampire squids. Oh, very neat. Um, and the the sperm whale was really cool. That is cool. Any big um, jellies? So lots of cool jellies. Um. I'm sort of partial to the cephalopods. They they're they're real um, interesting to see on the on the videos. Um, lots of neat neat invertebrates of all different types. Lots of crabs. These cute little things called squat lobsters. Um, lots of different sea cucumbers and echinoderms. I mean, you can find something from basically every taxonomic group um, on those videos. So lots and lots of different things to see and explore. And now that you're not at school and enter, want to see something cool, um, this is the place to check out even though the ship is not exploring right now. So that's all I sort of built in, but I'm happy to answer questions um, if there's people with questions. Yeah, um, so why don't we open it up for questions and sure. if you, you do have a, a question you could put in the chat, we can take maybe three or four questions. Hey, Bethany, just so you know, the children have on their anti-boredom list, I already put on Nautilus Live and I've already okay. encouraged them to go. I also have a picture of the two cups. Let's see so the, the cup go. here is the Dunkin' Donuts regular size. And here is the actual cup <laughs> down on Nautilus. Yeah, I, I shrunk that right. one for mom. So there you go. That's <laughs> teeny tiny. And actually on this side, it says, if institute. There you go. And a picture of a zebra, of course. So you can see the sizes of the cups and what happened when it went down in the atmospheres. Okay. Yes, I, I'm trying to find mine as well. Yes. <laughs> Bethany, I, I had a, a question. Um, sure. Did they ever figure out which, like, did they ever ID the three wrecks um, that were in that group? Great question. Um, as of now, no. Um, they had some some hypotheses they were working with, um, but we don't have a firm identity beyond that we think uh, Monterey A was a, a, pi a privateer, a, a pirate vessel, and the other two were sort of merchant ship prizes. Um, now, and do they also think that they were sunk at the same time in the same storm, or do you think that they do? So they're yeah, they're they, do. they think that all three vessels were sunk at the exact same time in the same okay. storm. Yeah. Okay, so could they then go back and see maybe like r newspaper records or that like? Because I assume they could date the pottery that they found on that ship to a time period. And then right. they could possibly go back into historical records, newspapers from the time period, whatever, to try and identify like possibly where the ships came from and then possibly go and see if they could find like records of those ships. Sure. So the, the neat thing about archaeology is it's, it is this big mystery, this big puzzle. And um, so they, they have been using a lot of, those sorts of records. The problematic thing about the Gulf of Mexico in that time period is there was so much travel, so much commerce, and privateers were largely undocumented um, because they were sometimes operating with a letter of right from a nation and sometimes they were operating truly as 
pirate on their own. And so we just don't have as as much information as we would really like. Um, they're they're still digging. Um, I know they really do want to identify these wrecks. Um, it's still possible, um, but yeah, wow. I have not heard from them what that of a of a true idea. That's that's the historian in me trying to to like this is the mystery thing that I love, and this is what excites me about shipwrecks in general is like the historical stuff behind it, and trying to figure out wh like who these people were that were sure. on board this ship. Um, sure, there, another there, another the question. Really thing about a lot of the artifacts is that they were really mixed from a number of different nations. So the muskets, there were um, Canadian muskets, there were French muskets, there were, you know, U.S. muskets, um, there was pottery from Mexico, there was pottery from the U.S. on there. I mean, there was just such a mixture and nothing was truly pointing to one sort of country of or origin or, or that nation must, ownership. That must make it very, very difficult then, yeah. I would assume. And that, that speaks to the international trade that was around mm -hmm. during that time period. Was it 1800s? Yeah, yeah. Okay, no. yep, that makes perfect sense. And that the fact that one of them was a pirate ship, like, would make sense as well. Um, given the time period and what was going on there. Wow, that's incredible. Um, did you happen to find any human remains uh, on any of the vessels? So yes, good we question, didn't. yes. <laughs> we didn't. Um, the, the closest thing we found were, you know, the soles of shoes, toothbrushes, utensils like spoons and forks. Um, any sort of human remains would have deteriorated long before we got there. Um, however, we did treat those wreck sites as burial grounds, essentially. Um, it was very clear because all of the navigation equipment was found within the ship that the crew didn't really have time to escape, right? Had they had time to abandon ship, they would have taken all of that navigation equipment with them and put it in a small boat and rowed away. Um, but they didn't. It all was went down with the ship, which is pretty indicative to the archaeologists on board that nobody escaped that wow, wrecking. Of that's, that's so sad. Um, how many, I mean, I assume in, in the Gulf of Mexico, there's, there's thousands upon thousands of shipwrecks just like this um, in the air, like, you know, in that immediate area. So how do you, I, I guess, discovering which ones it might actually be would be very complicated yes it's really it's tough for sure um uh cameron wanted to know do you see any sharks down there I think you um might. we didn't we didn't see any sharks um that deep there are sharks that live that deep i will say um when we were launching and recovering the rovs within about the first 50 or 100 feet below the boat. That's where we would see a lot of the sharks and bigger fish congregating, which is why we weren't allowed off for a swim call. Um, in, in certain places where Nautilus is exploring, it's a lot safer to like jump into the ocean and swim around and hop back on board the ship, um, but not there. Um, there were a lot, a lot of sharks and other things. And with the currents um, in that area, you can get swept away pretty quickly too. So uh, we all stayed on Board Nautilus, but we did see sharks, and there are other um, Nautilus expeditions. If you look through the videos um, on Nautilus Live, where you'll see videos of the sharks um, and, and Hercules encountering them. Well, very cool. I'll um, I'll ask one last question, and then I think we'll we'll wrap it up. By the way, here is my we little cup it. from Bermuda, um, and you know so. The Ocean Exploration Trust, they said there are approximately 3 million shipwrecks still left to find in the world's oceans. That's, that's amazing. So as a career, this is a big deal. And I think what you've presented today is just awesome. But, you know, and it's shown that it doesn't necessarily take one thing to be a marine archaeologist or an oceanographer in, in general, right? It, it takes Absolutely. history to get that baseline and, and get all that information from previous years and and things like that so um yeah so any any advice for our our budding young scientists to that want to get into this what would you recommend that they 
do to sort of make the steps towards having a career in oceanography dash marine archaeology dash everything else that you spoke yeah. about today yeah. <laughs> i think um continuing to cultivate your love and interest in science is important um and and being scientifically literate like learning about the world around you and understanding it and being able to communicate it is really really important so um i think just continuing to cultivate that interest in science and that interest in exploration is really important because uh, I mean something I tell my own students you know you might not be take on a career as a scientist but you might be a, a journalism major and have to write a story about shipwrecks or shipwreck expeditions and so then you can draw on your knowledge um, and your scientific career from the past to help you do that um, so that's really important the other thing I think is to just never limit yourself I think always sort of exploring um, what's out there and taking advantage of opportunities. Um, to be honest, when I applied for the Science Communication Fellowship, it was, it was sort of on a whim. I saw an email come through a listserv that said, here's something you can apply for um, if you're a, an educator um, and have an interest in this. And I thought, oh yeah, I'll probably never get it, but you know, whatever, why not? give it a shot, it sounds really cool. I mean, who wouldn't wanna go with Dr. Ballard's organization and look at shipwrecks or explore the ocean or do those sorts of things. So I did sort of apply on a whim um, and it just so happened that I was selected. Um, and I've met so many cool people doing that and all the other sort of experiences that I've had um, in the field of marine science, but continuing to, to stretch your borders and put yourself out there is really really important so obviously your education is important but it's the things you do in addition to that that are are really gonna sort of set you on this path to doing cool stuff <laughs> um miss smith do they still have um those applications for teachers to join right. in yeah missions? they do like, so every year there's a new crop of um science communication fellows that are chosen so they have chosen the ones for the 2020 expedition season that's supposed to kick off in June. Okay. But then um, towards the fall, the applications will go out for the 2021 fellows. Now, do you necessarily have to be a straight up science teacher or do they take historians and yep. Yeah, maybe all of those things. Um, yeah, all of those things. I uh, and even informal educators. So there's a lot of um, education team members from like science centers and aquariums that have come out um, as science communication fellows as well. Um, you know, somebody like Dr. Rob would certainly qualify to apply for for the fellowship too. So yeah, not necessarily limited to just science teachers or teachers in a formal education setting. Well, excellent. I think we'll uh, wrap it up there. Um, on behalf of everyone in the virtual world, thank you so much, Bethany. This has been awesome. Great to catch up and hear about your successes and, and adventures. So this is what we typically do. Everyone has permission to unmute their microphones and a big round of applause. Thank you so much, Bethany. It was lovely. Was fun. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And- um, Thank you. Yes. That, that was great. <laughs> I guess it's a word. All right. And